Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. How is everybody? Good. Man, there are a bunch of y'all out there today. Thanks for coming to church this morning. It's a good way to start the new year, right? It's also a good way to end the year. We we meet all year long, so you're welcome to come back the rest of the year. We're glad you're here. Um, That was a little joke. But um, I'm Joel. I'm teaching pastor here. We're going to continue our series today called Run. My buddy Jeff in the back, he just said, he came up to me and goes, hey, are you you in? And I was like, are you in? He's like, yeah, are you in? Like, to, for what? He's like, no, that's the series, man. Run. I was like, oh, that's pretty deep. That's deep, bro. Thanks. He works with kids, yeah. Works for my brain. So we're going to continue this series today. Um, but before we do, I want to ex- tell you guys about something real quick. Uh, I've, are you, some of you guys may use the YouVersion Bible app on your phones. It's a really cool app. If you don't know about this, it's free, completely free. I think there are up to a billion people have downloaded it. Uh, it's, it's a free app that you can get any translation of the Bible that you want, like any translation in any language. And on top of that, it's got some Bible reading devotionals. And I actually wrote one of those. I've written several of them, but I, wa- I wrote one that, that went live last Tuesday. And it's called Vision Map. And it's a great u- devotional for this start of this year. If you feel like God has given you something to do, he's put a, a task in front of you, but it just feels like something so big, you'll never be able to accomplish it on your own. If you've got a dream like that, or something for your future, maybe your finances for your family, uh, that's something God put in there because he wants to make sure that you know that it's not going to be accomplished without him. So as you work as if it depends on you and pray as if it depends on God, you, you might be blown away as you watch God kind of breathe in your direction and find that he opens doors for you you could have never opened on your own. He can open, I mean, he just one touch of his favor can open doors you could never open on your own. And he'll launch you into the futures. That, that, that uh, Bible reading plan gives you a simple strategy to kind of help map out where you're going to go. Now, you know, you can't plan your life. You know, Mike Tyson once said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> uh, we all get a plan, but then life punches us in the face. But you, you can't necessarily plan every step of your life, but you can make sure you're aimed at something and moving towards it and working as hard as you can and then trusting God in the process. So you can go on the Bible app, put in my name, Joel Malm, or you can put Vision Map, and you'll find that. And uh, hopefully it'll be encouraging for you to start it here. It's a little five-day reading plan, so you could start it tomorrow and be done by Friday. Cool. We're going to talk about a, a word today that um, it's, it's a very offensive word. And it's a word we should, most people just are like, man, you don't use that word around me. I don't want to hear that word. Um, we're going to talk today about the D word. And... Um, you know, especially in church, you should, people just like, don't use the D word, you know, the, the D word, you know the word I'm talking about, right? Uh, right. Discipline. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody, somebody like, oh, I can't believe the pastor just said that in church. Discipline. It's one of those things that we, we just all know we should have, but, oh, uh, it's so hard. Discipline is so hard. But, you know, here's the thing, you know, it's the stuff that nobody sees that brings the results right. everybody wants. We look at somebody and we go, man, how did they get in so good a shape? Well, here's how. While I was on my bed sleeping comfortably this morning at 530, that dude was at the gym working his tail off. And I look at it and I go, I want that. And then you find out what it takes to get that and you go, well, I don't want that. I just want that, not that. And that's the challenge with discipline is we all want the results But the fact is, we don't want the work to get the results. So we're going to talk about the ugly, nasty, horrible D word today. And we're going to talk about how you can develop discipline this year to go after the things that God's put in your heart. Let me tell you a story. Uh, A few years ago, I think it was about seven years ago, I felt like God told me to write this book about a concept. And I spent about six months writing this book. And then I felt like he said, I don't want you to publish this book through a publisher. I want you to give it away. Free book. I spent six months of my life writing this book. Free book. We, we made a website for it to give it away. And then we started getting influencers to promote it. And based on the number of influencers we had, there was a chance that that, that book, when we launched it that day, was going to get out in front of a million people. And I thought, man, this is going to go crazy. It's a free book. Who wouldn't want a free book? Uh, we launched the thing. Apparently, nobody wants a free book. So 
We launched the thing, and I was thinking, oh, man, I couldn't wait. I woke up that morning. It went, out, it went live at like 6 a.m., and all these people started promoting it on their Facebook. We sent out all these emails and all these paid promotions and stuff. And I remember looking at the count, and it said 32 people had visited. And I'm thinking, 30, clearly it's 32,000. And I'm like, nope, there's no zeros after that. It's just 32. And I was so frustrated. I'm like, well, sometimes it takes a while for this stuff to take off. Right? I go to the next day. A whole other dozen people had looked at it. Anyways, over the next month, I'm just totally distraught that I put all this work into this thing that completely flopped. Nobody wanted even a free book. Like, well, that's an ultimate failure, right? When you're offering what you got for free and they don't even want it. And I remember going, I was like, God, what in the world, man? I was trying to obey. I did this for you. And he just kind of let the crickets keep going around me. Like, come on, speak up. What's the deal? Why did this go down this way? And he didn't say anything to me. I remember being so frustrated and going, man, I put so much work into this and I got so discouraged. I said, what is the point of all of this that I'm doing anyways? What's the point of writing? What's the point of this and speaking? And what is the point? And I had forgotten about that website we made. And this, er, earlier this year, I was kind of trying to figure out where we can save some money here and there. So I was looking at, I have a bunch of these websites we've made. And I'm like, oh, I could save $35 a year if I canceled that website. So I went to go look at the website and man, like tens of thousands of people have been to that website in the last seven years and I had forgotten about it. And there's all these email addresses people had given me. They're like, here, write me more. And I was like, I had just blown off the whole thing. And I'm like, all of a sudden there's this whole audience of emails that people are like, hey, send me more. Seven years ago they asked for it. But uh, <laughs> I had forgotten about it because it was, an, it was like a flop immediately. And I was like, oh, this is a waste of time. But what panned out over time was actually quite amazing, but I had forgotten about it because I wanted instant results and I didn't get them. Now, every one of us in here, we have this in common. There's some area of your life right now where you're saying something like this, I am exhausted and burnt out. And what's the point of doing this anyway? Some of you, you have been trying to get your weight under control. And you've been trying and trying and trying. And you're like, you know what? Everything I try, sure, I see a little bit of results, but ultimately I'm right back to where I started. What's the point of even trying anyways? I should just eat, drink Dr. Pepper, and be merry. <laughs> right? Some, some of you, you're looking at your financial situation. And you were like, man, this was the year we were going to do it. We're going to get the car paid off. All this, you know, everything is going to be good. We're going to be out of debt this year. And then, boom, the transmission blew up in your car. And here you are, $5,000 in the hole trying to pay for this stupid transmission. You're like, God, I thought you were going to help me this year. We had a big dream. We were going to do this together. I was going to be financially independent, blah, blah, blah. Then you're like, well, what's the point? I just, what is the point? Some of you, it's your marriage. You've been trying and fighting and struggling, and you know God's been telling you you need to fight for that marriage, but you're just like, what's the point? Everything I try to do, I hit a brick wall, and it just is not going anywhere. Some of you feel that with your kids. You're just like, what is the point of keeping these kids around? Is there a place I can return them? Like, some place I can drop them off, just deposit them, it's just like I, everything. I, what is the point of even trying? Like every time I try and teach them about, like get them disciplined, they don't do it. And we've all got, yeah, we've got so many areas of our life where we just go, ah, oh, I've been trying and trying and trying, and I'm so frustrated. What's the point, anyways? So we're going to talk about today when you get to the point of what's the point? What is the point? We've been looking at this verse in Hebrews. 12, where the Apostle Paul, he's talking. Uh, in Hebrews 11, he starts off by listing this group of people that have come before us, these saints that have come before us, these heroes of the faith that have come before us who lived by faith. They didn't know what the results were going to be, but they lived by faith and they moved forward. And then he picks up in Hebrews 12, he says this, he said, now listen, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, saying, therefore, since all the, because all these people came before us, we now are, are standing on the shoulders of giants, and now it's our turn to do our part in carrying on this walk of faith. And you're not alone. This isn't, this isn't the first rodeo, right? A lot of these guys have been through greater challenges than we went through, okay? 
This, there have been global pandemics before. There have been recessions. There's been inflation before. This isn't the first time this has happened. And a lot of people have gone through that before. And you need to recognize those people made it through and you're going to make it through too. He says, but here's how you're going to make it through. He says, since we've got all these people as an example before us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Now we talked last week about how there's two kinds of weight. There's the weight that after you lift it, you feel stronger in the end. You may feel weak for a while, but you're like, man, I know I'm getting stronger from lifting this weight. But then there's the weight that kind of sneaks up on you. You're like, where did this come from? And that's the kind that slows you down. And I'm not just talking about physical weight. I'm talking about those things that we do that make us feel weak after we do them. When you've been a little dishonest about something and you just don't feel the strength. That, you know, the, there's a verse that says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. The best example I can think of that is Grand Theft Auto. Like, if you steal a car, why are you going to draw attention to yourself? And all these morons steal cars and then peel out as fast as they can, drawing attention to themselves. I'm like, do it quietly. But the wicked flee when no one's going after them yet. But the righteous, they're as bold as a lion. So he's saying here, there's these two kinds of weight, right? And you want to get rid of the stuff that makes you feel weak in the end. Those conversations you have where afterwards you're like, everybody feels just kind of like they lied a little bit and compromised. And like, Ugh, let's just get out of here. And we all feel dumb. And, uh. <laughs> Stop doing that stuff. Stop doing the stuff that makes you weak. And he says, and, which clings so closely to us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, we talked about this word race last week. Race is an interesting word. It's a word that Paul really liked. It's actually the, Hebrew, the Greek word for it was agona, which is where we get our word agony. And they translated agona. Paul uses it a lot of different times in the Bible. But agona simply means the struggle, the burden, the fight, the battle. But it also means race. So they translate it here because it says, let us run the race. They translated it as uh, let us run, they translate it as race. But what it's really saying here is, here's what we need to do. We need to run toward the unique struggle that each one of us carry. Because every one of us carries a unique struggle. And you can't compare your struggle to another person's struggle. We say, well, how come they have it so easy? You don't know how easy, if they have it or easy or not. You say, well, yeah, man, like I'm struggling over here. I can eat whatever I want, and they can't. Well, maybe that's your struggle, but maybe their struggle is something mental and internal, an issue they have. And if we sit around comparing and looking at other people, Paul says when we compare themselves to themselves, they're not wise. You don't compare yourself to other people. That's why it says you fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. If you sit around spinning, they're thinking, oh, my struggle's not, their struggle's not as hard as mine. It's going to lead to nowhere good. You have to embrace the unique struggle. Whatever the challenge is that God's put in front of you, he's going to give you the grace you need for your struggle. So stop looking at other people and comparing how easy they have it compared to you and focus on the struggle that you have in front of you. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. And this is what we talked about last week, the fact that you're going to suffer and struggle one way or another. There's just no way around that. There's suffering in life. Life is difficult. My dad, he, one time he, said, he came to me and he said, Joel, uh, I was up complaining about something. He's like, who told you life was going to be easy? It wasn't me. I'm like, yeah, where did I get the idea life was going to be easy? And a lot of us, we have this idea that life's supposed to be easy. And we're just always frustrated because it's so hard. And This isn't fair, but listen. Get over it. Life is hard. And once you recognize life is hard, then it kind of loses its power over you. The hard stuff happens. You're like, well, of course, this is life. It's hard. So you don't whine and complain. You just go, bring it on. What are we going to do about this? So this is the word. It says you're going to suffer or struggle one way or another. Make sure it's suffering for something that gets you something good in the end. You know, there's unnecessary suffering. That's the suffering that we bring on ourselves by doing unwise things. And then there's necessary suffering, which is the suffering that God allows into our lives to make us into who we're supposed to be. I wish he made us who we were supposed to be by eating Twinkies, but he doesn't. <laughs> he says it's through much suffering and acts. It says it's through much suffering we enter the kingdom of God. You're like, I don't like that. Yeah, I don't either, right? I don't like it. I don't like it as much as I don't like discipline. But there's something about resistance and struggle that strengthens us. God made us. Again, we talked about this last week, so I'd encourage you to go watch that on the app. 
Something about resistance makes us stronger. And you say, well, I don't, I don't face a lot of resistance. You actually do face resistance every day. Do you realize gravity is resistance? Yeah. Gravity is constantly pulling on you, and your body has to fight against it. If there was no gravity, your muscles would get weak very quickly. That's why astronauts in space have to exercise a lot of hours a day because they have no resistance on their body. You're like, oh, that'd be a wonderful place to be in. There's no resistance. Yeah, but you'd also float off. We need resistance. Resistance makes us stronger. We're made to bump up against some things, push, get pushed back, and be stronger. So he's saying, Paul's kind of, kind of saying here, like, you've got a struggle in front of you. Don't make additional suffering by unnecessary suffering. But what you can do is you can try and stop as much unnecessary suffering as possible, and then you can embrace the suffering God allows in your life that's necessary and find meaning through it because there's meaning that's found when we embrace the responsibility of how we're going to respond to suffering that's good. that is good <laughs> but there's more that was just last week's message so paul continues in, in hebrews and he says this he says consider him this is jesus who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you don't grow weary or faint-hearted He's saying, hey, God, Jesus, like God in the flesh, had a lot of resistance. A lot of resistance against him. So, so look at how he handled all that resistance. So that you don't get tired and go, oh, what's the point anyway? It says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you, <clears throat> that addresses you as a father addresses his son? And here's the word it says. My son, don't take light the Lord's discipline and don't lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. You know, letting your children do whatever you want can actually, whatever they want can actually be a form of abuse. If you're not teaching them where the boundaries are, it's actually a form of abuse. But if you love your children, you discipline them. And sometimes you have to tell them, this is going to hurt you way worse than it hurts me. But it's going to be good for you in the end, right? <laughs> Endure hardship as discipline. Think about the struggles that are coming to you. Remember, life's going to be hard. So he says, endure hardship, shift your mindset, get a little perspective shift and say, oh, this is discipline. This is a chance to be disciplined. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Now, when you prepare a message, uh, I, I like to look at a lot of different translations of the Bible because you can get different nuances to Hebrew words, Greek words. Sometimes you look at the original Greek like that word, agona. And I looked up this verse, Hebrews 12, in the King James Version. This part where it says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. And this is what it says. This is the King James Version. For consider him that hath endured such gainsaying of sinners huh? against himself, that ye wax not weary, fainting in your souls. So I'm thinking about discipline, right? And then this word wax shows up. And the first thing that comes to my mind is Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> and I'm specifically reminded of this one clip well, watch it. Watch this clip here. You karate training. I'm what? I'm being you slave is what I'm being, man. Now, we made a deal here. So? So? So you're supposed to teach and I'm supposed to learn, remember? For four days, I've been busting my ass. I haven't learned a thing. Ah, you learned plenty. I learned plenty. I learned how to sand your decks, maybe. I wax your car, paint your house, paint your fence. I learned plenty, right? Ah, not everything is as simple. I'm going home, man. Daniel-san. Daniel-san. What? Come here. Show me Sander floor. I can't move my arm, all right? What are you doing? What are you... Ow! Ow, what are you doing? Now show me. Sand floor. How did you do that? Shut up! Sand the floor. Mm. Da, 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 da. Hey, stand up. Show me sand floor. Sand. Da, da, da. 
Sand of Roa. Sand of Roa. Big soccer. Sand of Roa. Sand of Roa. Now show me wax on, wax off. Aye. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, wax on, hat. Wax off. Hat. Concentrate. Look at my eye. Lock a hand. Thumb inside. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on. Wax off. Hush. Show me paint a fence. Up. Down. Up. Down. Up. Down. Other side. Look, I. Always look, I. Show me paint the house. Side, side. Lock wrist. Side, side. Side, side. Ush. Show me wax on, wax off. Show me paint fence. Hey! Hey! This! This! Show me side to side. This! 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 Show me sand of floor. Hey! 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 So I rarely use movie clips, but I don't think there's much that does a better job explaining what discipline that God works into our lives looks like. It looks like this a lot of times. God's asking us to do all sorts of stuff. He allows stuff into our life, and we're like, this stinks. Why is this happening? God, I feel like you're a slave. And he's like, well, you are my slave. <laughs> But I'm teaching you something through this. But we don't realize that, you know, life has lived forward, but we only understand it looking backwards. And as you embrace this struggle, the discipline, you all of a sudden look back at one day and go, oh, that's why I needed that. That's why he had me go through that. I thought he had abandoned me, but oh, he was actually training me like Mr. Miyagi. That's what it says here. It says, if you're not disciplined, and everybody undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate. You're not true sons and daughters at all. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. If discipline was pleasant, everybody would do it. But painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So discipline is this. Discipline is saying... I know this is going to be painful and uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it anyways because I know there's something I'm learning from it. Scott Peck says it this way. He says, discipline is the basic set of tools we require to si solve life's problems. And the foundation of discipline is something Jesus showed us. It says, it says we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So the foundation for discipline is this, for the joy that was set before him. He said, Jesus, God, if there was another way other than me being flogged, beaten, spit on, hung on a cross, bleeding out, please, is there another way to do this? But if there's not, not my will, but your will be done. Because I know there's something bigger going on here. So discipline is saying, I'm going to pay the price up front for the glory that comes on the other side. And yeah, it's going to stink. <laughs> it's going to be horrible. But I'm fixing my eyes not on what's right in front of me, the immediate pain. I'm fixing my eyes on something ahead. And I love how it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Look, I, Daniel-san. 
Don't look at the pain. Look, I. The discipline is building something into you. And the mistake that a lot of us make is we think we're ready before we're actually ready. And what we need is we need delayed gratification. But delayed gratification, which is fixing our eyes on the thing further down the road instead of this right here, what we usually say is, well, I'm ready now, Lord. I'm ready. I'm ready. My sweet little daughter, Elise, has been wanting an electric scooter. She sees these kids tearing past us on the road. They're just going way too fast. And she's like, yeah, it's Jeremiah's kids, actually. Where are they? I'm just kidding. Jeremiah lives across the street from me. But uh, she sees on the scooter, she's like, Dad, I need a scooter, electric scooter. And I'm like, Elise, you would kill yourself with an electric scooter. You can't even balance on a non-electric one. She's like, Dad, no, I can't. And she'll, so she borrowed Jeremiah and Hillary's, one of their kids' a little scooter. And she'd go like a foot or something. She'd be like, look, I did it. I'm ready for an electric scooter. I'm like, no, sweetheart, you are not ready for an electric scooter. Well, Elise is finally ready for an electric scooter because she's been practicing. And she's been building up. And she's got it down. She's right, Elise, you're ready now. But, you know, what, what, how foolish of a father would I be if I gave my kid an electric scooter right out the gate? Here, kid, go out and have fun hospital run so many times we're like i'm ready i'm ready i talk to guys all the time that want to get into ministry they're like man i've been saved for a year why won't the pastor let me up there speaking at the pulpit like first of all you have no clue what you're asking for man but they're like but i i've got it i'm ready i'm ready he's like no you're not ready but here here's what's what's crazy about it is like we're so short-sighted we're short-sighted in our discipline I've been fat. I, man, I've been, I've been uh, doing this uh, diet for 10 days and nothing's happening. <laughs> I had a guy come on a hike with me one time and he told me this. He said, man, it took me 35 years to get into this bad of shape. He's like, but this hike forced me to really get in enough shape to where I knew I wasn't going to die. But he's like, I got to keep up these patterns. You know, patterns, they, they compound over time. And a lot of times we think we can fix in a year what it's taken 20 years to mess up. That's so good. Mm-hmm. I have guys come up to me. I just want my marriage. I had a guy come up to me one time. He's like, I just want my marriage back to normal. I'm like, well, what's going on? He's like, my wife left. I'm like, sounds like she doesn't want it back to normal. <laughs> That's why I don't do counseling anymore. But <laughs> I mean, I'm willing to, but nobody wants to come back. So... <laughs> <laughs> don't do that all right uh we all have these things that we build through disciplines and choices we made and then we want them fixed overnight but we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what discipline can produce in five seven ten years so you got to hold on y'all some of y'all are heart a, fighting a hard battle that you cannot you're just like, I can't get over the hump here. Well, you've been working on it for 20 years, getting it this bad. So it may take 20 years to get it back, get it fixed. But if you'll stay faithful, you can do this. And then the Lord comes in and grants his grace. It may happen quicker than you think, but you can't give up too early. You've got to stay strong in the middle of it. And he'll, he knows when you're ready for it. He knows when you're ready to handle the electric scooter. But he's not going to let you get killed in the process tell people all the time, be careful what you ask for. You may get it, and it may be your curse. <laughs> Got to be careful. Delayed gratification is the foundation for discipline, saying, I know there's something better on the other side. I know there's something better for me. I believe it so much that I'm going to suck it up right now. I'm going to take the pain that's involved. And I was thinking about this. This is actually what faith is, you know? Like faith is believing so much that God has something for you, that his promises are true, that what he says works, even when it doesn't look like it's working, even when the diet doesn't look like it's working, even when the saving doesn't look like it's working, even when the confronting things in the marriage doesn't look like it's working, you have to trust that in the end, God's way is always going to win out. So you take the pain right now for the better payoff in the end, because you can pay it now or you can pay it later. It's always more pricey later. But most of us want to take it now and God is saying to you if you'll choose to delay gratification have faith that when you do the hard work right now the reward will come in the end he will 
reward. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently, faithfully seek him. Diligence, faithfulness. Don't overestimate what you can do in a year, but recognize in five years you might be able to pull that off. And it may take five years to get there, but if you'll stay faithful to it. There's this famous study that's done. It was called the Marshmallow Study. They bring a bunch of kids into this room, and they give each of the kids a marshmallow one at a time. And the kids come and sit with an adult. And they give the kids a marshmallow, and they tell the kids, hey, I'm going to leave. The, this marshmallow is for you. I'm going to leave the room. If you take, if you eat this marshmallow while I'm gone, that's fine. But if you cannot eat it while I'm gone, I'll give you more marshmallows. And so there's these videos of these kids. You know, you got this marshmallow taunting them right in front of them. They're like, <gasps> Well, they studied these kids, the kids that took the marshmallow, ate the marshmallow, and the kids that didn't. You know, it's kind of split. And they studied them over several decades of their life. And here's what the study discovered. The children who were willing to delay gratification and waited to receive the second marshmallow ended up having higher test scores, lower levels of substance abuse, lower likelihood of obesity, better responses to stress, better social skills as reported by their parents, and generally better scores in a range of other life measures. And it all started because they waited for the reward on the other side if they didn't eat the marshmallow. So my encouragement to some of you today is this, and this is what happens. When you set out to change your life and do something good, it's invariable that an easier option will show up. A quick fix will show up. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs that are starting their own businesses, and I tell them, now, you've made this decision to start your business, but let me just warn you something. As soon as you do this, an easier option is going to come along that's going to promise everything you've ever wanted, but it's going to keep you from doing what you feel called to do in your heart. I had one girl that she was setting out to, she was starting out uh, an organization, and as soon as she quit, I said, as I called her the day she quit, I'm like, congratulations on quitting, but be no, know this. You're about to get an offer that's beyond your wildest dreams. She's like, well, how do you know? I'm like, because that's the way it always rolls. Something about the universe, or maybe it's the devil. I don't know. But he always presents an easier, like the one marshmallow thing. Like, you can get that one marshmallow right now. Sure enough, she called me there. She's like, how did you know? She's like, I got offered this job I've been trying to get for years, and they offer me double what I'm making now, and I can start tomorrow. And I was like, what you going to do? She's like, I ain't taking it. I'm like, good for you. But that's what always happens when you try and do something to change your life for the better. There's always going to be an easier option. An option you can pop that marshmallow in right now. Or you can say, no, no, no. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. Always look I. Because he didn't go for the easy path out. He accepted the hard path. And man, thank goodness he did because we're all beneficiaries of it. So we fix our eyes on Jesus and say, man, for the joy that was set before him. So you need to get a picture in your mind of what the joy that could be set before you could look like. What could it look like to get your health back? What could it look like to get your finances under control and have more money to be generous with others? What could it look like to have your marriage fixed? Get that picture in your mind and then fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't be comparing to everybody else's struggles around you. Fix your eyes on Jesus and go after him. And trust the discipline that he allows in your life. Endure hardship as discipline. And the results will be exceedingly, abundantly, far above all you could ever ask or think. Because it's through much suffering we enter the kingdom of God. But suffering isn't the end. That's why Paul said we rejoice in our suffering. We know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So we don't lose heart. This light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is unseen is permanent, but what is seen is temporary. Always look I, Daniel son. Take the discipline. Endure hardship as discipline this year. Because God is preparing you for something glorious, something greater than anything you can imagine for yourself. And you say, I don't have the power to do it, though. I've tried, man. I've tried this before. Listen, it's not going to be you who pulls it off. It says in Romans, it says, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you, and he will give life to your mortal body 
if you'll lean into his power to do this thing that he's asking you to do, then you will get to the other side of this and you'll be stronger for it. You'll be more disciplined and you'll be just a little bit more like Jesus, which is the goal. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus who set the example for us, man. He endured the cross, despising its shame for the joy that was set before him. And I pray, Lord, that we would fix our eyes on Jesus this week, this month, this year, in the coming years as we are prepared to go after what you've put in front of us. And when it gets hard, I pray that we wouldn't moan and complain. We would just go, ah, I must be on to something because all good things have a price. So I thank you, Lord, for, I pray for anyone here that's struggling in their finances, in their marriage, with their kids, in their relationships, with their health. Lord, I pray that you would give them the power to overcome. I just pray for victory for them this year as they buckle down and do the D word, discipline. Trust you in the process that you're going to give them the power. If you're here this morning and you do not have your relationship right with Jesus, the foundation for everything I've been talking about starts by surrendering your life to him and letting that spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead come and live in you. I'm going to say a prayer in a second. If you say this prayer, you mean it with all your heart. Jesus is going to come in. He's going to forgive your sins, wipe away your past, and set you on the path to the destiny he has for you. It starts by saying this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sins. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.